When I was a graduate student back in the late 1990s at the University of Illinois, the story of how Mark Andreessen had developed the first web browser, Mosaic, at the university's National Center for Supercomputing Applications, and then had gone on to found Netscape, was legendary. I also remember at the time, though, that he was involved in something just a few years prior called the Browser Wars with Microsoft. And that is something we will come back to today. And Netscape survives in the form of Mozilla Firefox, which not many people use. But Andreessen hasn't gone anywhere either. He recently released a widely discussed essay, The Techno Optimist Manifesto. And contrary to recent doomsayers about technology, especially about the power of artificial intelligence, Andreessen argues that technology is the key to human progress and that free markets are the only way to unleash its potential. Does he fully realize and appreciate the meaning of what he is saying? Do other tech leaders who admire his manifesto understand the same thing? What does real admiration for the power of technology look like and what does it require philosophically? Well, those are some questions we're going to discuss today on New Ideal Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. Welcome, my name is Ben Baer. I'm a fellow at ARI. With me is my colleague, Don Watkins. Hi, Don. Hey, Ben. So part of the reason we wanted to talk about this uh, manifesto today by Andreessen, is not just that it's been uh, widely discussed and controversial in, uh, on social media in the last few weeks, but, but also because uh, it has some, there's some really good stuff in this, tech, in this manifesto that deserves to be uh, highlighted. As, as you'll see later today, it also has some things that we want to critically scrutinize. But uh, Andreessen has become influential in the last few decades as a, as a venture capitalist. He invest, invested in many influential tech companies, and we've been hearing a lot of him lately. Uh, some of you may remember just a few years ago uh, in the middle of 2020, really in the depth of the pandemic, when supply chains were breaking down and uh, things looked rather gloomy. He came out with a very optimistic essay, It's Time to Build, saying that the, uh, the mentality of the builder, the ethic of the entrepreneur had been underplayed, that it was time to uh, revitalize it and uh, looking at the destruction around us, rebuild from uh, that terrible time. Uh, he earlier, just earlier this year, also released uh, an essay that I thought was really excellent about why AI will save the world, uh, responding to some of the, the real anti-AI doomsayers like Elizir Yudkowsky, calling them even members of a religious cult, which I think is quite on the nose. And now we get this latest essay published on the website of Andreas and Horowitz, which is his venture capital firm, the Techno Optimist Manifesto. And before we say anything uh, critical about this, and there will be some, some of that to say, I think we should highlight what's, what's really good about this essay. And I'll start with just one quotation from it. There are many that I could read that are, that are also good, but uh, Andreessen writes, technology is the glory of human ambition and achievement, the spearhead of progress and the realization of our potential. Uh, he goes on to back that up. He, he backs it up and argues for it contrary to not just the uh, people who are worried about artificial intelligence, but those who see technology as antithetical to all kinds of human values, to jobs, health, environment, to the uh, happiness of our children, to our very humanity. And he, he gives a long list of the people he's targeting, the people who talk about existential risk, sustainability, ESG, social responsibility, the precautionary principle, etc. He sees technology and, the, and innovation in technology as really a symptom and central expression of what it is for human beings to grow as, as individuals and as a species. And he sees the, the only alternative 
the alternative world in which there are regulations put on uh, the development of technology, like some people want to do with artificial intelligence, the alternative is stagnation for our society. Uh, because he thinks the growth in technology, innovation in technology is what fundamentally enables the growth of productivity. When, when there's more that we can do using our knowledge of science to uh, manipulate the world around us, we, we get to do more with less. And that means that you know, even if someone's real wage doesn't, even if someone's nominal wage economically doesn't go up, their real wage is going up because there's more that they can buy. Uh, with a, a limited number of dollars. He thinks that we've used technology of one kind or another to solve any number of problems that, of survival that we've faced, everything from starvation to pandemics, and that this, reflecting on this history, gives us reason to think that for every form of technology, even the ones that seem to scare people, we should accelerate, not limit, the growth of innovation. Uh, that accelerating technology only creates virtuous cycles like the economic one that I mentioned before. Uh, and th this is the, he takes, he takes issue with the so-called precautionary principle, which says whenever there's uncertainty about what kind of harm might come from a new technology that we need to forswear it or limit it. Uh, he thinks that if we have free markets, Free markets allow for the coordination of information using the pricing system in a way that leads to discovering which technology works, which doesn't, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to various forms of central planning that would limit and regulate it. And I think one of the things he's especially good at in this piece, something that I saw him arguing for earlier in that uh, anti-AI uh, doomsayer, doomsayer piece, is uh, the role and importance of human intelligence in enabling and accelerating human progress, human happiness. And he sees artificial intelligence as, as just the latest application of this. And contrary to the people who say, oh, the, 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 the robots are going to take over and you know, put us all in the matrix, he thinks that what AI is going to do for us is, is basically augment our intelligence is going to be able to enable us to do more things with the intelligence that we have and probably increase our intelligence. And I think that there's, there's really quite a lot to that argument. Yeah. And one thing that he's criticized for that I think is really unfair is the idea that he's blind to the fact that technology does have risks. It does have downsides. Like clearly he is aware of that, but I, the view that comes through is if, if your assessment of those risks and downsides for a particular technology is not nested in a larger of awareness of the vital benefits of innovation, including its ability to help us overcome those downsides, you are going to, and I think this is part of the opposition to the precautionary principle, you are going to really harm human life. You're really going to hold back progress as the thing that makes us better. And so, I mean, take something even quite trivial, right? Like people find that um, I can, like I use social media more than I want. All right, that's true, but on the, that can be true. But on the other hand, there's a whole bunch of technologies that can help you manage that. So I can use a social media blocker that I'm going to say, all right, between um, 2 and 4 p.m., I don't want to be able to check Twitter so that I can really focus on my work. So there, there, And that's just a very small example of something that we see throughout the use of technology. Um, we create fossil fuels that have certain emissions, and then we create the ability to scrub those and make them wildly cleaner. So even when you identify negatives about technology, technology is almost always the key to minimizing and addressing those side effects. And none of that erases the fact that without these technologies and without continued progress, human life becomes way less enjoyable and death becomes much more of a looming threat. So I think he, the, the, the fundamental thing that comes through this is just putting our view of technology in its proper place that this isn't just something to go, yeah, that's good, or oh, it's great that we have some toys, or it's you know it's done some good things. No, you should have a fundamentally positive evaluation of technology as such, and be deeply, deeply concerned with well, what are the social, political, legal conditions 
that make technology and technological progress possible and be very, very skeptical of anything that's going to slow down human progress. Don, previously you were, you, you were sharing some thoughts with me about what you thought he was trying to accomplish with this document. Um, what do you think he's trying to accomplish with this document? I mean, I take seriously that this is a manifesto. Manifesto is it's a call to arms in a certain way. And if you, if you look at, um, he thinks that the appeal of techno-optimism cuts across the right, the left. It, it doesn't fit neatly into the kind of tribal boxes that have really um, kind of ossified and solidified in the debate. And I think part of the context that he's writing in is there's what has been called, you know, the progress movement or a progress uh, school of thinking. And I think th there's people like Mark who see this as a potential way to unify good people across an ideological spectrum and to kind of break the tribal logjam in a certain way. And he's trying to engage in that uniting. Uh, but as I think we'll see, the real I think there is something to that. I think this is a good project. And I do think that um, there are people on left and right who can unite around certain policy goals. Like there's a lot of thinkers who recognize that it's in the our inability to build housing, for instance, is keeping housing artificially expensive. Um, restrictions on immigration are keeping brilliant, talented people from working in free countries and keeping them in countries that don't utilize their talent and ability. And more broadly, I think there's a conversation focused on the value of progress that is starting to be had and that should really take center force in the country. But one thing I want us to be thinking about, and I'll have more to say on later, is to really build a movement there, you, you need a real agreement on what does that movement stand for? What is it trying to achieve? And why does it think that that's right and good? And I think there's a real question about whether there is enough fundamental agreement that you can have a genuine progress movement. But I think that's part of what he's trying to galvanize and trying to achieve with this. Well, this is perhaps a good opportunity for us to segue to uh, our first set of uh, critical comments about this manifesto. And Don, you'd think that if you if you wanted to start a movement dedicated to fostering progress, you part of what you would want to have an understanding of is is where does progress come from? What is its cause? And part of understanding that is what causes it to stop. And one of the things that this uh, one of the things this manifesto talks about is how there was a time in the past when we believed in progress, but these various intellectual movements that I referenced at the top in one form or another abandoned it. And he then tries to summarize what he thinks is the common source of all these movements. And I know you had some thoughts on this. Yeah. If you're trying to, um, resurrect progress as a cultural ideal, a big question that you should have in your mind is like, how did we ever lose that? And even before, like, how did we gain it in the first place? But in particular, how did we lose it? And I don't think there's a real accounting here of that. There's a claim that essentially like communism was a big turning point. Um, but the Ayn Rand, I think, has a really penetrating analysis of just this question and the uh, part of it comes in her analysis of the move from what, the old left to the new left that the old left preached hey the if you believe in progress communism is going to outproduce capitalism it's less wasteful it's more rational and then of course that all fell apart in the mid 20th century it was very clear that capitalism outproduced socialism. And so what you saw on the left was a real crisis. And they, they, they really faced a choice. Is it going to be progress in capitalism and we'll drop the socialism? Or are we going to keep the socialism and drop progress? And the rise of the new left was really, no, we will we'll not embrace capitalism. We're not going to drop socialism. 
And so what we're going to do is reject progress. And the question, the question is, well, why that? Like, why make that decision, which sounds crazy? And part of Ayn Rand's view that I think um, we'll see validated by, I think, this uh, manifesto and by the reactions to it is that in the end, their um, capitalism is inherently self-interested and that the conventional morality that says selfishness is immoral, that service to others and sacrifice for others is the essence of morality. This is fundamentally at odds with capitalism, with free markets, with freedom. And that unless you're willing to take a stand in favor of self-interest, in the end, you can't effectively defend uh, and value freedom and capitalism. And so that if you're asking at the deepest level, like why did we lose a commitment to progress? I think it's because progress in the end can only be achieved in a culture that values and liberates the pursuit of an individual's own happiness. And that is something that no intellectuals were willing to actually embrace. Yeah, your, your example of the, the left's reaction to and uh, a replacement for uh, communism in the 60s and 70s is really good example because it, at least at first glance, it seems to be a counterexample to his thesis that it was communism that was the source of antipathy to progress. After all, didn't, didn't the communists want to uh, build all kinds of new infrastructure uh, in, uh, and didn't they even succeed to some extent in building all kinds of new infrastructure in the Soviet Union? Now, of course, we know it didn't, it didn't end up too well, but uh, there was at least an element in that movement that was pro-progress. And then obviously there's an element in it that isn't, and that's the element that succeeds. But then the question is, uh, what is the deeper idea behind communism that, that allows the one element to win out and the other one to eclipse? And yeah, I, I agree with you that his, his diagnosis of the causes of progress and its abandonment are, are fairly superficial. And I mean, one sign of that for me was one of the early lines in the piece where he says, for hundreds of years, we properly glorified technology until recently, which makes it sound like uh, uh, glorifying technology is something like the human default that we're all just born uh, glorifying technology and then someone comes along and, and ruins everything. But it, that's at the very least over optimistic and over dramatic account of what happened in the past. Most of human history, there was no progress to speak of and therefore no progress to glorify. Uh, it was only for a very brief period in the Enlightenment and uh, after the Enlightenment and, and, and during the Industrial Revolution, when, when progress actually starts to happen, when people realize that this progress is happening and then actually start to reflect philosophically on what accounts for this, what could possibly explain this completely unprecedented phenomenon in, in human history. And so there, the point is that just the fact of having progress and reflecting on what its causes are is an enormous achievement that's not some kind of default that you just get knocked out of. You first have to figure out what causes the, the progress that people then start thinking about and then what causes people to reflect on it. And it, it takes a certain kind of historical perspective. It takes a, a philosophical perspective, one where you don't think people are uh, pre-programmed by defaults, where you think, wow, one of the things that's significant about this progress is that we're not tied down uh, by the ways of our ancestors, that we can, we can pick up stakes and move to new frontiers and and dramatically accelerate ourselves in a way that none of our ancestors for tens of thousands of years have ever done. And what is it about human nature that makes it possible to break free from the restrictions and the shackles of your ancestors in that way? And I mean, that's, that's part of the perspective that you need to bring to this question. And it includes, among the philosophical issues that it includes is the question of morality and the question of its relationship to self-interest, which you, which you mentioned before. And I think there's more that this manifesto has to say about that issue that we should talk about. 
Yeah. And so the issue of self-interest comes up in the piece that like he, he definitely mentions it. Um, interestingly, he doesn't mention Ayn Rand. So he, at the, at the end of the piece, he has a list of the, what does he call them, Ben? The um, saints of saints of uh, progress or saints of techno optimism or something like that. Something like that. And he has a They're list saints. of all of these uh, economists and philosophers and so on. He doesn't mention Ayn Rand. He doesn't mention John Gall, which is a fictional character in Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Um, and it's interesting that that's the only case we get of a fictional character. Um, but what he invokes is the the kind of analysis of self-interest we get from Adam Smith. And so it's the idea of, um, yeah, self-interest by itself is not a good thing. It's not a, a morally noble thing. He has a, a line about like, have you looked at people? People aren't that great. But the great achievement of a market is that it channels this, let's call it at best, amoral force into social ends, into the collective good. And that's the kind of achievement of the invisible hand. And so the, the that's the closest we get to kind of really contending with self-interest. He says, look, there's just a fact of life. Um, human beings are fallen creatures. He invokes this idea from the economist Thomas Sowell called the constrained vision, which says it's a pessimistic view of human life where we have limited knowledge. We're not that morally noble. We, we won't really act for the interests of others all that often for its own sake, but we can design systems that by the invisible hand direct it to a socially desirable outcome. And um, the, my view, at least, is this is wildly insufficient as a defense of freedom and the progress that freedom makes possible. And um, one indication of this, though I don't think it's the only one, one indication of this is Adam Smith made that argument in the 1770s, and it didn't work. It did not actually address the attacks on capitalism as the system upholding self-interest. And so why I think it's sufficient today if it didn't prevent bad ideas, if it didn't answer the critics of capitalism at the very beginning, why in the world is that going to be a compelling and convincing argument now? And Mark doesn't answer that question. I mean, it's, it's definitely a question you have to grapple with if you want to think about what are the causes of progress because as i mentioned before it's really only in the post enlightenment period that uh, that thinkers start coming up with theories of progress and 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 realize it's a thing and that it needs to be accounted for and well what are some of the things that happen in this period that pretty obviously have some relationship to that realization we have the scientific revolution we have people being able to apply uh, the products of their thinking to real problems in the world and uh, lifting their material standards because of that. And that goes hand in hand with uh, an embrace of reason as opposed to faith. That's related somewhat, by the way, incidentally, Don, to the rejection of the idea of original sin, which is something that uh, Andreessen and so is is, in, is basically invoking when he invokes that doctrine from Thomas Sowell. So, you know, if you think that we're basically fallen creatures, which is that's a word that Andreessen explicitly uses, you'll have a harder time making sense of the possibility of progress. Falling is is the opposite of rising, uh, to put it frankly. So there's there's all these developments going on in the post enlightenment period in the way we think about human nature, and one of the other philosophical developments in this period is a widespread questioning of the opposition, the conventional Christian opposition between morality and self-interest. And it's never questioned in a way that, in this period at least, leads to a viable positive alternative of the kind that Ayn Rand provides. But it's breaking down and you can see it breaking down in various figures. So you have people like Hobbes and Mandeville who are, who are psychological egoists who think that really everything that everybody does is selfish, including the stuff that people thought previously was, was moral. 
And there's a lot that's problematic with that position, but it shakes the period up in a lot of ways where people tr try to come up with different ways of responding to it. And there are thinkers like Shaftesbury and Butler who are not psychological egoists, don't think that everything that we ever do is selfish, but who do think that many of the things that were uh, previously regarded as moral are actually motivated by self-interest, that that motivation doesn't preclude the possibility of virtue. And there's a period here in the, in the uh, 17th, 18th century where, where had a better philosopher come along, uh, they would have been able to synthesize a lot of important lessons from the ancient Greeks and from the uh, discoveries of the scientific revolution and the power of reason uh, to realize that there is a morality of reason and that it concerns the promotion of human life and that this means the pursuit of happiness, which is, of course, a concept that's near and dear to the leaders of the Enlightenment and the American Revolution anyway. Uh, unfortunately, you don't have a philosopher in this period who does that. You, you, have, you have some who take us in the opposite direction, but it's not really until the 20th century that you get that full-throated defense of the morality of self-interest in, in Ayn Rand. And, and uh, Don, it's, it, I also noticed the fact that, that Andreessen has this list of patron saints of uh, techno-optimism at the end, and it is, it is notable that he omits Ayn Rand but includes John Galt when Ayn Rand, I mean, it's an alphabetical list, and so Ayn Rand should have been first on the list. Uh, people might not raise their eyebrows at John Galt uh, quite as easily if they don't know who he is. But we, we know that uh, Andreessen knows about Ayn Rand because he's been, he's been posting quotes from her and references to her essays onto social media um, rather regularly for the past uh, couple of years. So the fact that she doesn't get credited when uh, he's at least, he, he must be getting some of his ideas from her. The fact that he doesn't credit her is, is uh, eyebrow raising for me. Yeah, me too. And if you think about the kind of argument that she offers, so he invokes, for instance, Hayek and the, the Hayekian argument amounts to, look, um, we're not smart enough to have a, a good dictatorship. And, you know, if only we had, you know, a central planner could have sufficient knowledge, then clearly like this would be the right way to conduct an economy. But alas, you know, uh, given the limits of human knowledge, we can't do it. Ayn Rand has an article, um, an ab conservatism, an obituary, and refers to uh, as the argument from ignorance, there's also underlying it and, and very related to it, which you also see in Hayek, the argument from depravity is that we're not morally good enough because we're driven by self-interest in order to be slaves under a socialist dictatorship. And if you, um, it, it, and if you think about her argument for capitalism instead, it's, it, which is in Atlas Shrugged, it's in capitalism, the unknown ideal. It's not like tucked away where somebody is familiar with her as Andreessen is like wouldn't notice it's that yeah capitalism does protect and enshrine self-interest but not in the lying cheating stealing way you think it it what it protects is genuine self-interest the long-term rational pursuit of a person's good which consists of thinking production and voluntary trade that's what's protected by capitalism. That's what's rewarded by capitalism. And that is something good and something that should be celebrated. Um, but it takes a real courage to hold that view and to reject the idea of serving and sacrificing for others. And if you look at um, Andreessen's piece, he so much doesn't want to challenge altruism, indeed tries to justify it in exactly these sacrificial grounds. He has a line in there that says, in effect, um, this is close to a quote, that um, capitalism is, th that uh, progress is not the result of um, like entrepreneurs and innovators exploiting society. It's them being exploited for the sake of society or them being exploited for the sake of the public good. I don't know if you have the exact quote in front of you, Ben. Um, 
that is like the whole lesson of Atlas Shrugged is that the um, destruction of progress and freedom is the result of the exploitation of the thinkers, the innovators, the creators. And that if you really value production and freedom and progress, that you need to reject the whole morality that says it's right that they be exploited for the sake of everything else. And uh, A, I wish Mark had been willing to challenge that. But B, if not, he should at least acknowledge that the the idea that um the way that this is written is these are the set of beliefs we who believe in progress and we who are techno optimists all embrace that we should serve the public good that we should um have markets but also with the regulatory welfare state at least acknowledging that yeah maybe some of us don't agree with these principles would have been nice and at least would have been honest because he knows that there's a different perspective um that Ayn Rand held. So related to that, Don, uh, you mentioned earlier how it's interesting to look at the arguments of someone like Adam Smith, who tries to justify relatively free markets on the basis of their contribution basically to collective welfare, and that they don't ultimately carry the day. and when you look today at the reception that Andreessen's arguments are getting, there's there's a similar point that you can make. And and we we both of us we read some of uh, the the critical articles written about this manifesto in uh, the left liberal press. And uh, wh how did you see that that issue coming up in the way they evaluated his position? Yeah, and we we can dive a little bit into some of their detailed claims, but I would say almost universally the um mark and his manifesto are attacked for upholding selfishness and greed and condemning capitalism for unleashing selfishness and greed in other words it's exactly what you would expect based on Ayn Rand's analysis that um it, that there is this conflict between our conventional morality of altruism and capitalism and so if somebody's defending capitalism and progress, the, like they're going to be accused of being for self-interest and they better have some defense of it. And, and that's just what screams through all the analyses is uh, to give just one tiny example of this. Almost everyone I read says, yeah, we don't need to listen to Mark because he's a billionaire. And if you're rich, you have no moral standing in the debate because that's proof that you're greedy and therefore proof that what you're really trying to do is just defend your own narrow interest, your own financial well-being. You're not sincerely interested in the truth. And that, like, that is the whole tenor, is we can dismiss this whole argument because we all know that, that it's motivated by greed and self-interest, and we all know that greed and self-interest are bad. Yeah, that's, a, that's an especially common trope uh, in response to the the arguments that come from tech entrepreneurs on a number of topics, you see it especially with uh, the reaction by the left to the advocates of so-called effective altruism, which we've done other podcasts on, um, many of whom are themselves tech entrepreneurs. Elon Musk has said favorable things about effective altruism. And you'd think that if, uh, if anything, we're going to convince the, an audience that uh, you're not quote unquote selfish, it would be that you're interested in giving away lots of your money for the sake of achieving long term uh, uh, happiness for the human race, which is what effective altruism is supposed to be about. But once again, we get all these arguments that no, 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 uh, this is just a rationalization for their being greedy because now they can show they're giving stuff away and we don't have to think of them as immoral anymore, but they secretly really just want to make money. Um, one of the pieces that we both read was the one that appeared in the New York Times by Elizabeth Spears. And in addition to the point you mentioned, I thought one of the interesting things she says, uh, criticism she makes of Andreessen is that he basically divides up the world into uh, the tech overlords and then the rest of us. 
and the rest of us are the unwashed masses, people who have either unskilled jobs or useless liberal arts degrees or both, uh, and that they exist mostly as aut automatons whose entire value is measured in productivity. And it's, it's worth saying just briefly in defense of Andreessen that he never does any such thing uh, as divide the world into these two classes, the overlords versus the unwashed masses. That's pure interpolation on this author's part. And, and if anything, uh, he argues that the more technology advances, uh, especially the more artificial tech intelligence advances, the more all of our intelligence is going to get augmented, allowing more and more of us to do more things with our minds, breaking down whatever barriers there might have been between uh, technology overlords and, and the rest of us. He says, intelligent machines augment intelligent humans, driving a geometric expansion of what humans can do. And I raised this in connection with the previous issue because you know, if only someone were able to argue that when the tech entrepreneurs who do exist, which do have you know, greater abilities in certain respects than others, if only someone could argue that the fact that they are using their intelligence to profit doesn't pit their interests against the interests of all the rest of us. If anything, it's the opposite. It's that the more you create value, the more you trade with other people value for value, you create mutual ben beneficial interactions. And that's something that doesn't come up in, in Andreessen's argument. It, it, it's something that has to come up when you start thinking about the relationship between morality and self-interest, but there's just not enough of that. Uh, another one of the reviews that we both read was this one that appeared in the uh, socialist magazine, Current Affairs, uh, article by Jag Bala and Nathan Robinson, who's the editor of that publication. And they accuse Andreessen of having basically a kind of religious faith in the power of technology. Uh, they say faith is indeed the appropriate word for this kind of optimism, which is totally unjustified confidence in one's ability to know how the future will unfold. Um, a point which conveniently ignores or evades the whole central thrust of Andreessen's argument that what technology is, is in essence, embodied human intelligence. Intelligence is not faith. Intelligence is making scientific observations of the world and, uh, and applying them uh, in a rational way, which is, is the complete opposite of faith. But this is something that socialists and altruists always evade, the role of the mind in human progress and the role of the mind in prosperity and the role of the mind in the accumulation of wealth. And the reason they evade it is because they assume if someone is pursuing and the, the creation of wealth, that it's uh, something that comes at someone else's expense. Again, that idea that you pit people's interest against each other, that we live in a zero sum world, but it becomes a lot easier to see the connection between morality and self-interest. If you in fact realize that self, that true self-interest, just like wealth comes from the creation of values, not from the exploitation of others. When you create a new value, you're not taking it from someone because it didn't exist anywhere before. And that's the fundamental reason why there isn't a conflict between the interests of rational people. If they're both focused on creating value through their intelligence, something the Marxists never want to concede is a real thing, then one person's interests do not come, does not come at the expense of others. Yeah, they Don, one um, other thing. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, just going to note, uh, but their whole worldview. So part of the criticism, Mark, that you see in that latter piece is like he's holding out this idea that we're all going to that under progress, we'll all get uh, better off. We could we could uh, including the very poorest in the globe. But the poorest in the globe could get much better off really faster if we just took a whole bunch of wealth from rich people. That is, instead of having, instead of relying on these mutually beneficial relationships where nobody has to sacrifice, which is what's under progress, uh, like 
no, if our if our whole goal is the common good and lifting people out of poverty, we could do it way faster by taking um, Andreessen's wealth and a whole bunch of other rich people's wealth. And, and so again, it goes to this issue of that um, that you the whole perspective of progress needs, I think, a self-interested basis. And part of getting self-interest right is itself non-sacrificial nature. But once you concede that, no, there's something good about sacrifice, then I don't think there is a counter argument to, yeah, well, why can't you give some of your billions to um, alleviate the poverty of people in Africa? And now they would say, well, we, we you know, you mentioned the effective altruist point, but part of the criticism of effective altruism is precisely the idea of, well, why should rich people get to decide through their own judgment where the money goes? No, that that is still them being greedy, selfish, and powerful. That should be a judgment of society and uh, therefore done by the government. So the, the, the whole issue is colored um, by this perspective that sacrifice is the good and that self-interest is a moral disqualifier. The, the quote that you were looking for before, where it comes out that even this manifesto is relying on this idea of sacrifice is as follows. We believe central economic planning elevates the worst of us and drags everyone down. Markets exploit the best of us to benefit all of all of us. And that that exploitation of the best of us is is exactly the sacrifice that you're talking about. And one place where it comes out in stark relief uh, is in Andreessen's scattered, somewhat cursory comments about the nature of, ca of capitalism and its relationship to the issue of competition. And this is the last big thing we'll talk about today, but it's really important. Um, as a way of getting into it, I'll mention that New York Times piece that we were talking about before, I had criticized their critique, but I think inadvertently they actually get one criticism right when they say Andreessen divides the world into these tech these overlords versus the unwashed masses. He's they're wrong that he's dividing the world that way, but they are right that there's a view coming out of this piece where we exist mostly as automatons whose entire value is measured in productivity. And where that's especially clear is not how they think about the unwashed masses, but precisely how they think about the best of us, the, the tech entrepreneurs. They exist as automatons whose entire value is measured in productivity from Andreessen's perspective. And you see that in various places in this essay, some of which we've already talked about, but here's another line. We believe the ultimate moral defense of markets is that they divert people who otherwise would raise armies and start religions into peacefully productive pursuits. That's just like the language about exploitation. Apparently people, in this case innovators, exist to be diverted for the sake of some kind of higher social goal. And the idea that entrepreneurs exist to be channeled toward the ends that Andreessen thinks are more productive is something that you really see coming out in his attitude toward uh, capitalism and monopolies, so-called monopolies. He says at one point, the motto of every monopoly and cartel, every centralized institution not subject to market discipline is we don't need, we don't care because we don't have to. Markets prevent monopolies and cartels. Now, why is he separating monopolies from cartels here. Cartel is a government franchise uh, where no one is allowed to compete by law. Now, you could also define monopoly that way, but he's treating it separately. What could he possibly mean? Well, more clues. He says, we believe in David Ricardo's concept of comparative advantage as distinct from competitive advantage. And elsewhere, we believe in competition because we believe in evolution. And Don, I think what he's getting at here is uh, he adopts a view of capitalism. The view of capitalism that says the essence of capitalism is competition, which means there can be quote unquote anti-competitive businesses that are somehow at odds with the spirit of true capitalism. And what do you think he means here by 
the monopolies that are at odds with this competitive spirit. Yeah, I mean, he never comes right out and says it, but as you given, it's pretty clear that what he doesn't mean is the original conception of a monopoly as government protection from competition. You know, so um, I, I can't compete with the mail service. The government has made that a monopoly. Um, it's provided certain protections uh, for all kinds of industries and the where you're literally not free to try to compete with them. But there came to be a an alternative view of what competition was that in, in one form would be referred to as perfect competition. And this is the idea that competition is not about the freedom to enter the market. So it's not um, about, do I have the legal right to try to raise funds, start a business, put my shingle up and try to win over customers? But that what it really is, is a certain kind of outcome where you essentially have no barriers to entry. So anybody can just literally start selling instantly where there's, there's um, in effect, infinite competitors. Nobody has any particular impact on the price. It's competition where nobody's won the competition, where nobody has uh, amassed any kind of market, any kind of influence on the market. And traditionally, this would have been, you know, illustrated a perfectly competitive market would be something like, you know, um, a farmer selling corn, right? Like there's a billion farmers selling corn. I'm not in any kind of position to influence the price on corn. And uh, um, if perfect competition was just a model to do certain thought experiments in economics, it would be one thing, but it's often been treated as a norm. That is, if we see a dominant competitor, something's got wrong, people are being exploited, there's a problem here to be solved. And that seems to be the kind of view that Mark is um, identifying, is if there's a dominant competitor, that's a monopolist, and that's what the market is going to prevent. And since it obviously does not prevent that, and indeed, uh, his critics have pointed out, like, you're on the board of Facebook. They seem pretty monopolistic in the realm of social media. Um, then it's not clear exactly what are what are you opposing and how does the system that you're defending protect us from monopolies? Yeah, and I think it's important that it's not, we're, we're not just reading things into his text here because there's some... Uh, real world experience that we have that informs our interpretation. We know that in fact, uh, Andreessen at least has in the past been a strong supporter of antitrust law, the kind that's designed to curb alleged unfair competition and the kind of market dominance that you've been you've been talking about, Don. Because way back in the '90s, well, what were those browser wars in in part about? Part of it was just a regular old competition uh, between Microsoft and Netscape. But at one point in the mid 90s, Netscape's lawyers started lobbying the Department of Justice to file an antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft for the, the sin of wanting to, heaven forbid of all things, exclusively promote their own browser on the operating system that they themselves manufacture on the grounds that this is Microsoft exercising monopolistic, anti-competitive control of the browser market. And I mean, Mark Andreessen himself went to Washington with a number of other Netscape uh, principals to report on Microsoft's allegedly anti-competitive behavior at one point in 1994. This is the matter of public record. And he's uh, he's never taken this position back. He's, he's never said, uh, I'm sorry that I tried to use the force of government to shackle the freedom of Microsoft, uh, even though Microsoft was operating completely legally with regard to all of its own property that it had created. Uh, and of course, the result of that case was a, uh, in my mind, at least notorious, infamous uh, federal court decision in uh, 2000. Two, I think the United States versus Microsoft, where Microsoft is then put under a consent decree, forced to promote alternative br browsers on its system. Uh, and 
and I should say back in the 1990s, the Ayn Rand Institute was one of the few voices that was condemning this lawsuit that was that was critiquing antitrust law more generally on the premises that uh, I think Ayn Rand taught us about what is inherently unjust and non-objective about antitrust law. It's, it's based on this premise that uh, when a market player acquires market power or economic power, that this is somehow uh, an infringement on freedom, which is a complete aberration of thinking. It's economic power is not the same thing as political power. It's the power precisely to create values, which are then offered at a market, it, which is as opposed to political power, the power to destroy through force. Uh, and yet and noti it's antitrust noti law in that, that actually uses force. Yeah, and notice, Ben, notice his analysis of entrepreneurs. What the market does is it takes people who otherwise would have started wars. So his mm. whole view is that the kind of motivation that drives people to destroy is the same motivation that drives people to create. And there's that blending of economic and political power going on in his view of what motivates entrepreneurs. And it's the same one that's going on in the blending of um, a person who is able to legally stop you from competing with his business to a person who's just so good that he's very hard to compete with. You know, I think it's, it's super important that the essence of capitalism is not competition. The essence of capitalism is freedom. It's freedom from force, freedom from fraud, uh, freedom from the very kind of force that antitrust law exhibits and intensifies. Uh, competition is a byproduct of freedom. And if you have a real competition, then you have to hold out the possibility that someone is actually at some point going to win that competition. Otherwise, it's not a real competition, some kind of phony, uh, a centrally planned government scheme, which is the thing that Andreessen alleges he's opposed to. Uh, in fact, being able to win a competition in a free market is exactly what you need if you if you care about technological innovation and progress it's winning in a competitive market where one person becomes dominant and profits because of it because of that that they're able to accumulate the capital that drives innovation forward there are certain kinds of projects that right now um, players like amazon and, and microsoft and facebook are able to engage in because they've accumulated this this pile of capital that where they can invest in the long term in ways that no other tech startups can do. And so that's the point just in relation to if you want to have technological progress. But of course, it is also important to go back to the moral and philosophical point, which is to say, if someone actually creates a superlative product on a free market, where the reason that everybody's buying Microsoft's operating system is because it delivers a incomparable value at the price point that it's offered. They've earned that success through their own ability. And here it's not just the computer technical ability, but also the, the business ability that it takes to create and do market research. You deserve what you get. If you've done that, you deserve the results. And so it's not just you are a conduit to progress for the human race. No, the trade is a conduit to your improvement. And it doesn't come at anyone's expense because they decided the money they spent on that operating system was worth less than getting the operating system. And so they've profited too. Both players have profited. Both have lived as ends in themselves. And one of the things that somewhat galls me about this manifesto is the emphasis that's put on the importance of acceleration and growth uh, that spirals continuously upward for the sake of a society, but not for the sake of the companies, not for the sake of the individuals who compose them and run them and conceive of them. Why should the society's level of progress be able to continue, continually accelerate itself, but individuals shouldn't? Why is it that they should be exploited to benefit all of us to use Andreessen's language. 
no justifications given. I don't think any can. Do you have any final thoughts on this, Don? No, I mean, that I think really captures the essence of my perspective is that what's really missing is a the moral perspective that allows us to understand how capitalism works and why it's moral. And that like time and time again, you're seeing that you can't escape uh, the need for that kind of justification. Thanks, Don. We should we should wrap up and we'll start wrapping up by giving some resources for people to understand better some of the ideas that we've been talking about today. We'll start by pointing you to an essay by Ayn Rand. I think this link on screen, bit.ly slash arbigbusiness, is actually a link to a lecture version of the essay, America's Persecuted Minority, uh, Big Business. And this includes, among other things, her analysis of what's wrong with antitrust law how it's non-objective, how it is an arbitrary hate, it involves arbitrary hatred of ability and why it has no role in a capitalist system which involves actual freedom from force. Uh, I would also very much like to recommend a book by one of us uh, that uh, Don wrote with your own book, Free Market Revolution. And Don, I think you, you all, in addition to talking about some general free market principles and their relationship to the morality of self-interest. You also talk, you spend a fair amount of time talking about uh, our opposition to antitrust law. Is that correct? Yeah, but we talk about the way, like there really is a way in which competition is an important part of what takes place in a free society, um, though not in uh, the way that you should violate freedom to promote it. And then how antitrust cripples the ability of um, entrepreneurs to actually compete. So both of those are analyzed from an objectivist perspective and including a moral perspective that um, is, you know, sorely absent from most commentaries on these kinds of issues. Yeah, this is a really great book and I, I learned a lot from it. So I highly recommend it. Look that up on Amazon Free Market Revolution. And then one last uh, page of resources here, a couple of New Ideal Live episodes we've done in the past that touch on some of the topics discussed today. We did a previous podcast about Andreessen's essay, It's Time to Build, back during the pandemic, April 2020. And then more recently, Mike Mazza and I sat down with Chad Mills to talk about threats to regulate artificial intelligence, uh, uh, threats which I assume Andreessen himself would oppose. Uh, I wonder if he would share our reasons for this, but I, I recommend checking out that interview with Chad Mills, who's, who is an entrepreneur in the field of artificial intelligence. Okay, so that's all of our resources. I would like to now let people know that if they have questions they would like to see dealt with in future podcasts, please send us an email to newideal at einran.org. We're actually spinning out the Q&A podcasts into a brand new podcast stream, and we'll shortly be producing these on a monthly basis, a different topic every month. And so if you've got questions on anything, send those to us at newideal at einran.org. We will, by default now, be using the questions you send to us uh, for these future Q&A episodes. Uh, Otherwise, if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider subscribing to our channel on YouTube, which recently passed the 100,000 subscriber mark. We're very happy to have, have achieved that. And there'll be a little bit more news, I think, coming from us in the future about that. If you'd like to subscribe, please do so. Please click that bell to get notifications when we go live or post new recordings. Same thing if you're watching on Facebook or other forms of social media. Also, for all of these, please like, please comment, please share these episodes to help continue to push that, that algorithm in our favor. And if you have other questions about things that came up today or just questions about objectivism, send those again to newideal at einran.org. We try to answer all of the queries that we get, especially if we don't end up using them for some future uh, Q&A episode. So thanks, Don, for having this conversation with me. Uh, it's it's good to find uh, what is good in our culture. There's certainly a lot that's good in this essay, uh, but I think we should be mindful of the flaws as well. Thanks, man.